This is number 16 in a series of 80 Old Testament lectures. And we're studying the life of Jacob. And in our outline thus far, we've seen the devising brother and the deceitful son, the dreaming pilgrim, the frustrated family man, and now we look into the enterprising employee. As we said, Jacob spends some 20 years in the city of Haran after he marries two daughters of Laban and then has four wives, 12 sons, and at least one recorded daughter. And after the birth of his children, Jacob then decides to go home, but he's persuaded by his father-in-law Laban to remain for a while. So he agrees to do this, but under the condition that uh, Jacob be allowed to keep as his own all speckled or spotted goats and all black sheep. And uh, so Laban agrees to this. And then Jacob attempts to increase the size of the herd by removing some of the bark from certain kinds of tree branches and placing them in that area used by the animals for mating purposes. Now again, we must determine what the Bible records and what the Bible teaches. And certainly the Bible does not teach that uh, animals can be uh, marked this way, but it simply records what Jacob, still in a backslidden condition, attempted to do. Well, after a period of six years, that is to say after uh, six years had passed, then Jacob becomes a very wealthy man. Then he's commanded by God to return to Palestine again. So he leaves, but he leaves in the wrong way. He quickly breaks camp, and he leaves for home without bothering to inform Laban. In chapter 31, verses 17 to 21. Well, Laban, uh, upon hearing of this flight three days later, he sets out in hot pursuit, and he caught up with Jacob and his wives and children after a week's journey at Mount Gilead. And uh, he came with murder in his heart. I think he would have probably done Jacob in, but God had already warned him in a vision even before he got there not to harm Jacob. And uh, so Laban does, does though, re uh, rebuke Jacob, especially not only for uh, sneaking off without uh, saying goodbye, but he accuses him of stealing his household gods. And uh, he makes a real big thing about this. Now, the New Schofield Bible offers the following comment concerning these gods. It says, uh, This incident has long been a puzzle. Why was Laban so greatly concerned about recovering these images which Rachel had stolen? Attempting to recapture them, Laban had conducted a long 275 miles and expensive expedition. Why had he done this? Well, excavations at Nusi in northern Mesopotamia, in the region in which Laban lived, showed that the possession of the household gods of a father-in-law by a son-in-law was legally acceptable as proof of the designation of that son-in-law as principal heir. So it is no wonder that Jacob was angry that he should be accused of such a deed. And, uh, there's no, of course, he didn't realize that his wife had stolen these gods. And uh, there's no, there's, uh, we, no wonder that Laban also was so greatly incensed that he came chasing him. All right, uh, they, uh, apparently she did not give them back. But he never makes evil use of these images, which Rachel had stolen. But later on, he ordered that they should be buried at Shechem when he gets back into the land of Palestine. Well, Jacob angrily denies stealing these images because he's unaware of Rachel's actions, and he directs a tirade against Laban, and he accuses him of gross inconsistency and inhuman treatment during their 20-year employment relationship. And he says, you've changed my wages 10 times, and you've done this and that, and... and uh, at any rate, they demand, Laban demands, that he be allowed to search the uh, camels and to search the caravan bags and everything and the possessions, and Jacob lets him do it. But these idols are hidden in Rachel's camel saddle. and They were never discovered because she remained seated during the search. And she says the statement here in chapter 31, verse 35, I cannot rise 
up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. Many believe this, uh, her way of saying, or the biblical way of saying, that this time she was uh, pregnant with Benjamin, her last child, and Jacob's final recorded son. Of course, later she'll die giving birth to uh, Benjamin. Uh, but at any rate, at Laban's suggestion, the two men enter a covenant by building a pile of stones and calling it Mizpah, which literally means the watchtower. And then Laban then added these words upon the completion of his tower. And you read these in chapter 31, verse 49. The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. Again, one author has said concerning this, he says, careless reading of the word of God has made this statement familiar to millions in a totally false application. That this statement should be engraved on rings, made the motto of a youth organization, and used for a benediction to close a meeting is preposterous. It did not stand for blessing, communion, and fellowship. Rather, it indicates armistice, separation, menace, and warning. In effect, the pillar of Mizpah meant, if you come over on my side of this line, I'll shoot to kill. I'll kill you. A covenant breaker would need God to take care of him because the other side would shoot to kill. And sort of, uh, you know, uh, God, like the farmer, that uh, noticed somebody was stealing his watermelons, and so he put a sign up on a tree near a watermelon patch uh, and then hid behind a tree uh, with a shotgun a nearby a tree, and the sign read, God help them that help themselves, because he was going to blow them out into eternity. And so here the same statement, the philosophy, the Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another, uh, you better not cross over my line. Certainly did not stand for, uh, as I say, fellowship and communion, but rather for separation and armistice. And this brings us now then to the next part of the outline, the determined wrestler. Jacob is again ministered to by angels in uh, chapter 32 as he makes his way now, continuing on toward the uh, land of Palestine from the land of Haran after a 20-year uh, trip. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of the Lord met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. Now, this is the first time in the Bible that the armies of heaven are mentioned, and that's literally what the phrase means, God host. The host is composed of angels, and there are many instances in the scripture showing this divine army in action. For example, later in Joshua 5, Joshua is visited by the captain of this host, the Lord Jesus. And then in 2 Kings chapter 6, there's a prophet named Elisha, and his young servant are reassured by this mighty army, and they see that the entire area is surrounded by the angels of the Lord. And then in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus announced to Peter, remember Simon Peter in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is arrested and he pulls out a sword and is going to attempt to do a bodily injury to some of the soldiers. And uh, Jesus said, put up your sword, Simon. They that live by the sword will perish by the sword. And he announces that he could call, he could have called upon this divine army, these angels of heaven, to save him from the cross. But uh, had he wanted to, but thank God, of course, he did not choose to do so. And in Matthew 26, where the passage is uh, related, Jesus says that he could easily have called down 12 legions. And we believe that there are around 6,000 in a legion of Roman soldiers, and so 12 legions would be approximately 72,000 angels. So there are millions and millions of angels. And here Jacob is ministered to by a whole army of these angels. In Psalm 34, verse 6, David would write about the angels of the Lord, and he says, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Well, at this time, on his way home, Jacob learns the terrifying news that Esau, his brother, was on route to meet him with 400 men. And Jacob is simply petrified with fear. So he immediately does three things. Number one, he divides his household into two groups. And this is his reasoning. He says, if Esau come 
to the one company and smite it, the other company which is left shall escape. And then the second thing he does, he cries out to God in prayer. In Genesis 32, verses 9 to 11. And at this time, in this crisis of his life, Jacob acknowledged perhaps for the first time, in verse 10 he says, I am not worthy the least of all thy mercies and of all thy truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. Well, of course he wasn't worthy and none of us are worthy, but now this proud, arrogant, uh, heel catcher, as he's been called, this smooth man, is now realizing that apart from God he's nothing. And, uh, and then he sends out a bribe gift to Esau consisting of 550 animals, hoping that this will uh, cause Esau's heart to be softened somewhat and his anger to be pacified. The third thing he does then, he has a wrestling match with God. Because that night, by the river Jabbok, there occurred one of the most mysterious and wonderful events in all the Bible. In verse, uh, verses 24 to 29 of chapter 32, we read about this. And uh, the Bible says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, the angel or this mysterious character did, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And so the mysterious character said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hath prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore it is that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. God didn't tell him what the name was there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And then in verse 31, And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. Now, uh, whatever theology is involved, one may glean from these strange verses of God and man engaged in an all-night wrestling match, there are two facts clearly emerge. Number one, his name is changed from Jacob, which means that crooked heel catcher, to that of Israel, which signifies one who has power with God. God still loves to change the names of men. He changed Abram from Abraham to from Abram to Abraham, and he changed Cephas from Cephas to Peter, and here he changes the name of Jacob from that of Jacob to Israel. And the second important thing I think we learn here that Jacob never walked the same after this soul struggling session with God. He walked with a limp. And I'm sure it's very obvious the next day that his children and his wives and his servants said, You know, Dad or my husband or the boss, simply he doesn't walk the same. Something happened to him. He never walked the same after that experience. You see, Jacob had then called the name of this place Peniel, which means the face of God. God had touched his heart, I think, at Bethel. That was his conversion. But here at Peniel, he claimed his life. Someone has said that the former place, Bethel, saw his conversion and salvation, but this place witnessed his consecration and sanctification. The first, Bethel, had introduced him to the peace of God, peace with God, but the second freely gave him that peace of God. He now possessed not only life, but abundant life. Of course, John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. I think probably he picked that up at Bethel. 
and that they might have it, Jesus said, more abundantly. And here probably this took place at Peniel. Well, the next morning came, and Jacob, bowing and trembling, meets Esau. And to his surprise and immense relief, Esau embraced him. In some ways, Esau came out looking a little better, morally speaking, at times than what Jacob did. But it had been a long time, over 20 years, and Esau had apparently become a wealthy man in his own right, and uh, he's not. he just got tired of carrying around that grudge in his heart. Well, Esau wanted Jacob to accompany him to the land of Seir. This is in uh, Edom, modern Edom, and uh, which is down by the Dead Sea. Well, this is the furthest thing from Jacob's mind. He was afraid that uh, Esau would change his mind and kill him. But instead of simply telling Esau this, he hides behind his children. And in verse 30, chapter 33, verse 13, he said, You know, I'd like to come with you, brother Esau, but my Lord knoweth that the children are tender. I have some young children here. And the flocks and the herds with young are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. But Jacob promises, however, to meet him and see her. He said, you go ahead and I'll meet you and see her. Of course, uh, he turns around and heads the other way, and he has no intention of meeting him and see her. And I often wondered when Esau got there what he thought about uh, Jacob's glowing testimony concerning God's grace when he learned that his brother had once again deceived him. Okay, now, in chapter 34, on the way back, we have the story of the enraged father. That's what we've entitled this. And there are several things that are involved here. In chapter 34, and this is a dark chapter in the scripture, concerning his, it concerns his only recorded daughter, whose name was Dinah. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which he bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, she's running around now as a teenager, she's uh, loose on the hoof, as it were, and Jacob's letting her run foot loose and fancy free. He should have been taking care of her, this young virgin daughter of his. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Now, whether he raped her or whether he seduced her, we're not sure. I would think probably he seduced her. Well, at any rate, his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel. Whether he raped her or seduced her, he began, he fell in love with her, and he spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father, Hamar, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. I want to marry this girl. Dad, you work it out. So Jacob heard how he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Jacob was boiling on the inside, but he allowed uh, his brothers to come and sort of handle the situation, and Hamer doesn't realize this, of course. And so Hamer, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob heard out of the field, where it came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, that was their sister, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamar communed with them, he doesn't know anything about this, this hatred now, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and possess ye therefore in, and get you possessions therein. And you see, uh, this happens today, of course. The world says to the children of God, why don't you just settle down here, and uh, we'll intermarry, and uh, we'll uh, get along with you, and we'll respect your religion. You get along with us, and we'll res you respect our religion. You see, the Bible says, come ye out and be separate. And we are in the world, but we are not to be of the world. And at any rate, verse 13, the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer, his father deceitfully, and said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said unto him, see, they're going to try to trick them now, 
and uh, so they can defeat them later on in battle. And they said, well, we'd like to do what you say, but we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. We just can't do that because we believe in circumcision, and doubtless you've never practiced that. But in this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will come as one people. But then if you won't do it, then we can't give our sister to allow you to marry her. And the words pleased Hamar and Shechem, uh, Hamar's son. And so they uh, allow themselves now to be circumcised, and in verse 24, and to Hamer and, his, and, and to Shechem, his sons hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. And what a sordid passage now we have to read, but we're studying the word of God. It's just amazing what God's people can do when they get out of the will of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have the account of apparently a saved man living with his father's wife, his stepmother. And Paul says, such a thing that you're doing is not even mentioned or done or allowed by the pagan Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. And here it is, something that even the pagans probably would not have done. Because in verse 25 we read, And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, of course, uh, the flesh on their body was swollen. They could barely move without excruciating pain. That two of the sons of Jacob, one named Simon, the other named Levi, Dinah's brethren, these are the sons of Leah, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all these males. Now we can just imagine as they helplessly attempted to squirm and, and painfully agonizingly on the ground and these men went around and just butchered them like hogs and they slew Hamer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister and then they took the sheep and the oxen the asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. It sort of just wiped out the whole uh, city there. Well, Jacob learns about it, and he's just furious. And Jacob said unto Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Pezzarites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me, and slay me, and I shall be destroyed in my house. Well, the only retort they had. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? And you know, even at this late stage in Jacob's life, we sadly note that he had a lot of maturing to do because apparently he expresses no sorrow over the defilement of his only daughter, Dinah. He just doesn't uh, weep tears over that. And then he voices no regrets over an entire town being exterminated. He's apparently is unconcerned about God's feeling in this either. His main and perhaps his only concern about this whole thing is that he be not hurt because his sons had done some bad things. He assumes no personable, personal responsibility whatsoever concerning this. Now we're going to skip ahead for a couple of chapters, and then we'll have to come back to chapter 35, because this passage, or this uh, section, is entitled, The Enraged Father. And uh, another son makes him very unhappy, too. Uh, Levi and Simeon make him unhappy. And uh, his fourth son, his name was Judah. And Levi and Simeon are guilty of murder, but Judah is now is guilty of adultery. And this is how it happens. Um, Judah marries a Canaanite girl, and I suppose that grieved him too. And uh, this Canaanite girl bears Judah three sons. One was named Ur, and the other was named Onan, O-N-A-N, and the third was named Shelah. You read about this class in chapter 38. 
And so uh, Judah's oldest son, Ur, marries a girl named Tamar. But God soon kills him for an unrecorded act of wickedness. We don't know what Ur's act is. God just tells us that Ur did something and God slew him. He did something wicked. All right, then Judah then commands his second son, Onan, to marry her. He said, all right, your, your brother's uh, dead and uh, the widow there needs to uh, be taken care of. Why don't you marry her? And so Onan marries his uh, brother's widow. Well, he also is slain by God because of a wicked thing that he did. And this time we're told about the wicked thing that he did. And you can read it there in, in Genesis chapter 38. Okay, now she's gone through two of them, Tamar, and uh, so there's a third boy left. His name is Shelah. Well, Judah promises Tamar to give her his youngest son, Shelah, in due time, although he secretly had no intention of doing this. And after a while, Tamar realizes that she's not going to get this third son. So she disguises herself as a common harlot and dresses up and everything, and she entices Judah into her, har into her tent for sexual purposes. Well, for payment, you know, what do I owe you after this immoral thing was done? She says, uh, I want your signet, your bracelet, and your staff. And then uh, he leaves the tent and forgets about it. Well, sometime later, Tamar becomes pregnant from this relationship. And then three months later, she the thing is out that she is expecting a child, and uh, an indignant Judah orders her to be burned to death. Somebody comes running up and says, Have you heard uh, about your daughter? Well, no, what happened? Is she hurt? Well, she's pregnant. What? My, her daughter-in-law, rather. And I won't have any immorality in my company, and so I burn her to death. And so perhaps uh, as he you know, begins to put uh, the torch to her almost, he says, Who's the, who's the husband? Who's the father of this child? And uh, so Tamar, and this must have been one of the most dramatic moments in the Bible, Tamar shows Judah his signet, bracelets, and staff. Well, a remorseful and the doubtless, a red-faced Judah immediately sets her free. Um, Tamar has twins from this union and calls them Pharaz and Zerah. And both this Canaanite prostitute woman, by the way, and her illegitimate firstborn son, whose name was Pharaz, would soon be included, would later be included, rather, through the amazing grace of God in the sacred genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this might bring up a question, and we'll attempt to answer it in another lecture, and the question is this, it traces back here to Genesis 38, God promises Jacob in Genesis 49 that the kings of Israel will come through the line of Judah. Okay, we know that to be a fact. But now the problem is the first king of Israel's name was Saul and he was not from the tribe of Judah. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And the question is why didn't God choose someone from the tribe of Judah to be the first king rather than choosing someone from the tribe of Benjamin? And by the way, God did make the choice. The answer is not, well, that was man's choice and not God's choice, because God chose Saul. But why didn't he choose someone from the tribe of Judah? And uh, I believe that chapter 38 answers this, and we'll expound on that more when we come to uh, probably 1 Samuel chapter 8, where Saul is anointed as king, the first king of Israel. Now this brings us to that part in our outline entitled The Obedient Patriarch. Now thus far, let's review, we've seen the devising brother in our study of the life of Jacob, the deceitful son, the dreaming pilgrim, the frustrated family man, the in enterprising employee, the determined wrestler, the enraged father, and now the obedient patriarch. And in Genesis chapter 35, God again reminds Jacob of his previous command to return to Bethel. Now apparently Jacob, when he came into the promised land, he settles down at Shechem, and he lives there for 10 years. Bethel's only 30 miles away, but when he comes back into the land, he doesn't go to Bethel. God wants him to Bethel. He comes short of the full will of God. And how tragically easy 
it is for a man, someone has said, to move toward surrender and then yet fall short of it. Jack, uh, this chapter records the first revival in the Bible. It was a great revival, apparently it took place, because Jacob here instructs his entire household to destroy their idols, to wash themselves, and to put on fresh clothing in preparation for the Bethel trip. And the idols then and the earrings are collected, and they're buried under an oak tree near Shechem. And uh, in your notes, you'll have later on a record of all the recorded revivals in the Bible, and this is the first recorded revival that I know of. Jacob arrives at Bethel. He's been gone for 30 years now. He was gone 20 years out of the land, then he comes back and lives 10 years at Shechem. So it's been 30 years now since he was in Bethel and the last time he was there. He, of course, had that dream and the ladder and the promise of God. And he calls it now, he builds an altar, and he calls this El Bethel. Not just Bethel, but El Bethel. I think that's a significant uh, change here. You know, remember, may remember we've already seen that the name Bethel means the house of God. But El Bethel means the God of the house of God. And the difference between these two concepts is the difference between knowing the word of God and knowing the God of the word. We are to read the pages of the first, the word of God, to acquaint us with the person of the second, the God of the word. It's like uh, the Psalm 23. Many unsaved people, radio announcers and liberal ministers and the man on the street often knows the Psalm of the Shepherd, the 23rd Psalm. But only believers know the Shepherd of the Psalm. And then now we have in our outline the final section in the life of Jacob, the sorrowing saint. In chapter 35, the last few verses, Jacob loses in rapid succession three loved ones. First of all, his own nurse Deborah in verse 8. Now, this woman, uh, first mentioned here by name, apparently came to live with Jacob after the death of her mistress, and after uh, Jacob's mother, Rebekah, dies, then um, Deborah comes to live with Jacob, and she dies here now. And then his beloved wife, Rachel, dies, giving birth to her second and Jacob's twelfth son, whose name is Benjamin. And uh, he calls her son of my right hand. And she's buried in the city of Bethlehem. This is the first mention of Bethlehem in the Bible. If you go to the Palestine, the Holy Land today, you'll see the tomb of Rachel right outside of Bethlehem. And then the third loved one that he loses in this chapter is his father Isaac. And he dies at the age of 180. And he's buried by Jacob and Esau. Apparently he meets Esau again alongside Abraham in the cave of Machpelah and uh, in Hebron. Um, so here we pretty well bring to a close the life of Jacob. Um, we're going to begin now just to introduce Joseph's life, and we'll take the next one or two lectures to uh, really get into the uh, detailed part of his life. This is one of the great stories in the entire Old Testament, the life of Joseph. As far as I know, of the 6,000 characters that walk across the pages of the Bible, and some of them are real characters, there are only two, apart from our Savior, in which there is no recorded sin attributed to. One is Joseph, and later on the other is Daniel. Now, obviously, both these men were sinners, and they had sin natures, and they needed to be saved like anybody else. But... There is no recorded sin in the life of Joseph. There was in Abraham's life, and Isaac's life, and certainly Jacob's life, but not in Joseph's life. We'll approach his um, outline, or his life, I should say, along the following sevenfold outline, outline. The favored son, and then the faithful steward, the forgotten servant, the famed statesman, the forgiving saint, the fruitful shade tree, and then the foreshadow of the Savior. 
And here we'll have some exciting comparisons to give you between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph was the greatest foreshadow of Jesus that ever lived. It all begins now with uh, a few introductory statements in Genesis chapter 37. We're told that these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Apparently what happened is that uh, he caught them sinning, and uh, so he goes to his father and he says, Do you know what, the, uh, what my half-brothers are doing? Uh, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. And uh, so this, of course, they frown on this and they hate him because of what he's done. Um, I think probably they hated him for a number of reasons. We've mentioned one already because he had reported some bad things that the, these ten people, these ten sons were doing. And secondly, because I think they hated him, the ten brothers hated Jacob or hated Joseph because he had become Jacob's favorite son. In fact, to show this special affection, the old man had given Joseph a long-sleeved, brightly colored tunic. And uh, these boys didn't have anything like that, and yet he gives this to Jacob or to Joseph now. And I think the third reason that they hated him was because of his strange dreams. And they call him the dreaming wonder. He's always coming up with these dreams. In fact, one of his dreams, he tells him about it. He says, they were all in the field binding sheaves when suddenly his sheave stood up and their sheaves all gathered around it and bowed low before it. Well, I don't think he made this up. I think he really dreamed this and I really don't think he was bragging. He was simply telling the brothers what he had dreamed and his father. And uh, his father puzzled over this, but uh, the boys, they just infuriated them because they felt he was saying, well, big shot, you're trying to tell us that you just made that story up anyway. You're trying to tell us that you want us to bow down and worship you. Well, of course, that would later really, uh, later, of course, come to actually come to pass in a way that none of the boys could, or including the father, would realize at the time. And then he dreams another dream. And during his second dream, he says he saw the sun, moon, and the eleven stars bow low before him. And again, this would take place later on uh, in Egypt. Well, so he already has generated much hatred on their part. And sometime after this, now uh, Joseph is sent from his home in Hebron to Shechem to check on his half-brothers and their grazing flocks. And so he goes to Shechem only to find out that they moved on north to a place called Dothan, which was uh, about 65 miles away from where he started. And so they see him coming, and they decide to get rid of him. And this brings us to the second part in the outline, the favored son, and we've seen the dreams of Joseph, and now we see the deceit of his brothers, because his ten brothers see him in the distance, and they determine to kill him. But the firstborn son, Reuben, apparently had second thoughts, because he said, well, let's not kill him, but let's just simply throw him in a pit and let him die. And we're told in... 37 chapter uh, verses 21 and 22 that Reuben was then planning to secretly return him to his father. So of all the boys, <clears throat> apparently Reuben comes off the best here. But at any rate, he's stripped of his coat and he's cast into a pit. And then ignoring his pitiful cries, we're told that the cruel brothers sat down to eat. And as they eat, they hear a noise in the distance and they see a caravan, a slave caravan of Midianites coming into view uh, on their route to Egypt. And so they say, hey, listen, we might as well make some money out of this uh, character. And so they, uh, they make a hasty and a heartless decision to sell Joseph as a slave. I say the nine brothers do this because Reuben apparently is gone at the time, and when he comes back, he finds that, uh, you know, the brother is sold into slavery, and he's really heartbroken over it. So they sell him as a a slave for 20 pieces of silver. And this was the going price of a slave. Later in the New Testament, our Savior sold for 30 pieces. Inflation apparently had uh, taken 
hold of the New Testament world. But he sold for 20 pieces of silver, and he's carried into Egypt. Well, we've seen the dreams of Joseph and the deceit of his brothers, now the despair of his father. Uh, they realize they're going to have to do something because Jacob loved his son Joseph so much. And so to conceal their horrible crime, uh, the ten brothers, apparently Reuben is a part of this also, they take Joseph's coat, they smear it with goat's blood, and they deceived Jacob into believing that his beloved son had been slain and eaten by a wild animal. And then Joseph is sold as a slave to Potiphar in Egypt, who was a captain in Pharaoh's Egyptian palace guard. Uh, that was his rank. And let me just stop here for a moment and say that that immutable law of retribution, which runs so strongly throughout the Bible, is clearly seen here in this chapter. In other words, uh, you know, the scripture says, what or, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the Bible says, if you sow the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. It's sort of like saying today, if you spit in the wind, you'll spit in your face. The point is that uh, here Jacob who once deceived his father by using the skin of a kid in Genesis 27, is himself now deceived in a similar manner. Of course, other examples of this uh, law of retribution would include the Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, who will later order the destruction of Israel by the waters of the Red Sea, and he himself was drowned there. That's the law of retribution. And then a fellow named Korah, who was an Israeli, and he caused a division in the congregation of Israel during Moses' time, and he himself was swallowed by a division in the ground. The ground opened up and took him alive down into the pit in Numbers chapter 16. And then a very ungodly sort of an Adolf Hitler of the Old Testament, his name was Haman in the book of Esther's, and this is certainly an amazing example of the law of retribution because he builds a gallows, in order to execute a godly Hebrew, was later himself hanged from those same gallows. All right, now, in prison, where Joseph learns many lessons. By the way, at this time, he is approximately 17 years of age. He's 17 when he's captured, and he spends 13 years working for Potiphar, and or in prison. And he's around 30 years old when he gets out of prison, and we'll see during the next lecture then what happens to him and the blessings of God in spite of this terrible thing and being sold into slavery. And certainly you could take that New Testament verse, Romans 8:28, and write it over the life of Joseph at this time. For we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, and to them that are the called according to his purpose.